back to part four of five of our series of reflections on the Confessions of St. Augustine. In section three, if you recall, we dealt with Augustine's very turbulent adolescence and clearly a turning away from God. In this section, we're going to be dealing with a period of slightly over a decade of time in which Augustine will be a searcher, but a searcher plagued not only by the challenges of a limited understanding of certain things that served as a barrier to true conversion, but also a personal struggle with chastity and continence. This part of the Confessions will span about an 11 year period of time and cover books four through seven. Now seven is sort of an interlude, a kind of state of his mind prior to his final conversion. Last time we went through adolescence, and in late adolescence, if you'll recall, Augustine, we could say, became a genuine seeker of truth, and not simply someone just following his passions. Augustine read Cicero's Hortensius, and this certainly changed his outlook and certainly turned him towards God. But he was a long way from being there. It was a far-off view. And his view of God would be tainted by a number of false senses, impressions, heresies, if you will. And so his sense of God, man, good, and evil were placing great barriers to genuinely embracing Christianity. Personally, he's plagued by sexual continence issues, something that spun out of his adolescence and would weigh down on him heavily for a long time. His poor anthropology, his poor sense of the human person, again tainted by uh, these false ideas, um, made him develop a, a poor theology, a weak fundamental theology that was essentially dualist. Dualism was very common at the time, and within dualism we see a great combatance between uh, good, which is spiritual, evil, which is physical, and this rather strange separation that periodically has plagued uh, history. Augustine certainly dealt with that a great deal, especially in his almost decade-long experience with the Manichees. We would see Augustine during this time move from Tagaste to Carthage to Rome and eventually to Milan. The beauty of this is while this was not a journey that he necessarily set out on, you could see the providential hand of God gradually leading him to the tutelage of St. Ambrose who would play a pivotal role in the last years preparing Augustine for his eventual conversion. During this time, Augustine considers, has certainly flirtations with marriage, and uh, even the idea of some kind of religious communal life. Finally, God's providence uh, will see coming to the very end of this time, uh, setting the stage for part five, where Monica and, August and Ambrose set the stage for Augustine's long-sought conversion. This period in Augustine's life, as we implied earlier, is going to be a long, twisty road. I'll try not to make it too complicated. Hopefully you can follow along a bit, but by nature it's a complex period. And this we would call his young adult timeline. 370, 371, uh, if you remember in the last session, Patricius, his father, died uh, while Augustine was uh, back in Tagaste, broke and so forth, couldn't continue with his studies. It was during that time that Augustine would take a mistress who is unnamed, we don't know her name, who he lived with for some 14 to 15 years, and they did have a son, a Deodatus, who will become more important even later. In 374, Augustine becomes a Manichaean hearer. Again, we're going to go into Manichaeism more later, but suffice it to say, he's moving into a very dualistic uh, cult, and it's going to be uh, complicating in his life. During this time, he also read Aristotle's categories and began to understand ontology, but he misapplied it to God. In this 
twist, if you will, this warping of his understanding of God is going to be one of those barriers that will develop as time goes on. In 375, after studying again in Carthage, he returns to Tagaste as a teacher of grammar, literature, rhetoric, if you will, which is law and public persuasion, and dialectic or logic. Now, because his father had passed away, he ended up being funded by a benefactor, a friend, uh, a follower, uh, Romanianus. And Romanianus will follow Augustine to some degree, uh, eventually being converted to Christianity. It seems like everything Augustine did, Romanianus did a bit later. In 376, he suffers the grief of the death of an unnamed friend, but then leaves to Gathi for Carthage and spends some time in medita meditating upon grief and upon the very nature of friendship. During this time, he begins to ponder very deeply, perhaps the loss of both his father as well as his dear friend, deeply on the transience, or if you will, the fleeting quality of created things, and that God is neither transient nor fleeting. In other words, God does not pass. This is one of those big steps in Augustine's understanding of God that will gradually, painfully almost gradually, uh, lead him toward a genuine understanding of God and his eventual conversion. Around 381, he writes his first book, De Pulchro et Apto, on the beautiful and the fitting. But at this point, being influenced heavily by the dualist Manichaeans, he is sti still unable to conceive of an incorporeal substance, in other words, a God, a genuine spirit. And again, this will plague him throughout much of this time. I tremble at the thought of trying to explain Manichaeism briefly. Manichaeism could be defined as a pseudo-Christian, illegal, popular, or at least during the time of Augustine, dualist, Gnostic cult that pervaded the ancient world, especially in the time of Augustine. It sought to solve the problem of good and evil in the world. It was Gnostic in its character. It was a Gnostic cult, which implies that somehow there are receivers of special knowledge. It was rooted in Persia and became quite popular in the Latin West at this time. It offered, at least initially at face value, an explanation for the tension between goodness and evil. And as Augustine said in Confessions, sin was in the heavens. Now the founder of this cult was Mani, who lived between 216 and 276. Mani's parents were Elkasites, a rather remote Jewish Christian heretical sect. They had rejected the Old Testament pretty much completely uh, and took ideas from Zoroastrianism, which flowed out of Persia, Buddhism, out of the farther east regions, if you will, and out of Christianity. In fact, Manny claimed to be Christian. I'm not sure how sincere he was in that or whether it was simply a ploy to try to call in Christians or whether he somehow deludedly imagined himself as the Holy Spirit or the Advocate of Christ. But a reminder, he's not Christian. This is not a Christian uh, denomination or something. This was clearly a pseudo-Christian cult. Manichaeism is very syncretistic. It pulls ideas that at face value might be glued together, but Underneath, uh, it, these ideas are in contrast with each other. They simply don't work together. They're at odds. Very simplistic religion, as many of these are. Um, and it had two kinds of persons. The elect, who were the ascetics, and the hearers, who were hearers. They were the, the lessers. We might call them the peons within this religion. Again, dualism oftentimes has these, or certainly Gnostic sects often almost always have a kind of elite and kind of a, uh, a mundane group, if you will. Radical dualism. God 
There's really two gods at odds with each other, a god of good, light, and spirit versus a god of evil, darkness of the physical. Spirit is always good. Physical is always evil. Without getting into great detail, I hope you can see that there's some serious problems right there. Now, what happens is that we who fall into the belief of this kind of dualism are caught between two great forces, a god of good and a god of evil. And hence, being sort of a pawn within this, we are not really responsible for our evil actions. Again, sin is in the heavens where the gods are. Uh, we might be prone to look at the idea of the devil made me do it. Some of you may be old enough to remember uh, the famous comedian Flip Wilson who had a character called Geraldine who would always say this. Uh, moral failure uh, is kind of tolerable, especially in the hearers. They're, they're lower, they're lesser. And so this, if you will, kind of gives cover for a misdirected moral life. Now, you might be asking, why do I have the pictures uh, on the right here? Well, dualism, the yin-yang of the East, run, certainly runs in this. We see here uh, the spread of Manichaeism in the years around Augustine's life and beyond a bit. And you see it pervading uh, kind of on a horizontal level throughout um, the kind of Mediterranean latitudes. We see uh, a stained glass of Darth Vader, not in any way to worship him, but if you will, the whole idea of the Force and so forth is a dualistic kind of thing pervading Star Wars, and it's not entirely unlike this. And we see here a picture of Romanianus, his benefactor, friend, and follower, who um, not only funded Augustine, but followed him and would follow him at Augustine's encouragement into Manichaeism. And then later than Augustine, he would convert out of Manichaeism into Christianity. A uh, complex set of beliefs. When Augustine looked back at his nine-year flirtation, or we should say involvement, in Manichaeism, he said the following, Throughout that nine-year period, from my 19th year to my 28th, I was astray myself and led others astray, was deceived and deceived others in various forms of self-assertion, publicly by the teaching of what are called the liberal arts, privately under the false name of religion, in the one proud, in the other superstitious, in both vain. On the one side of my life, I pursued the emptiness of popular glory and the applause of spectators with competition for prize poems and strife for garlands of straw, and the vanity of stage shows and untempered lusts. On the other side, I was striving to be made clean of all this same filth, by bearing food to those who were called elect and holy. Now, just a brief explanation here. As a hearer, Augustine would bear food, literally carry food, to the elect or the uh, elite of this um, uh, sect. The nickname for the Manichees at the time was the Melon Eaters, and they ate melons apparently in, in great volume because while obviously as physical beings they needed food, they saw anything physical as evil. Hence, the, even their food, they wouldn't carry it. It would sort of be fed to them. And melons, being mostly water, uh, were considered the least physical of foods, and hence they were popular among the Manichees. Again, this is not a, uh, an explanation of Manichaeism to any degree, but uh, Augustine then went on to say about, with this in regard to his eventual relationship with Christ, without thee I am but a guide to my own destruction. And clearly that kind of uh, thinking will uh, characterize Augustine's reflection on this period in which he was truly a lost soul, but because of his great persuasive abilities, his popularity and devotion of his friends, he not only went astray himself, but led others into it. And this was a source of great sorrow for a guy. Book five is Augustine's 28th year. 
And during that year, a number of important events happened. The first thing, a gradual thing, but in 383, it could be said that Augustine began to seriously question Manichaeism. Now, this cult had an awful lot of cracks. As we said before, it was kind of a loosely put together, very syncretistic kind of a cult. And Augustine, in his deep probing of anything, began to see the, the cracks that were within it. He didn't just give up on it. Again, he was very thorough, and all of his associations and so forth were largely attached to this faith at the time. And so he wouldn't depart it lightly. Well, the local uh, leaders, the elect, if you will, uh, knew that Faustus, the Manichaean bishop, was coming to Carthage, and they arranged for a meeting between him and Augustine. And Augustine looked forward to this meeting with great anticipation in the hopes that Faustus would genuinely be able to answer uh, the questions that couldn't seem to be answered by the locals. Well, Faustus turned out to be quite disappointing. He seemed to be spouting Manichaean platitudes rather than really answering any of Augustine's questions. So Augustine began to lose confidence in the Manichaeans, but he remained with them uh, because he, he really had nowhere else to go at the time, and again, his associations were largely there. But he would depart Carthage for Rome, where his friend Olypius was then practicing law, and left him with a better impression of how life might be for him in Rome. Now, what Augustine was frustrated with was a group of students known as the Eversores in Carthage, now, as the name implies, uh, these were students who were rather wild. They would disrupt class. They would barge into his office, things like that. And he found them just intolerable. And it was one of those things that sort of goaded him into an eventual departure, seeking a better place to serve as a teacher. This, of course, this goading, he would describe later as clearly providential. Now, during this time, uh, Augustine sort of escaped his beloved mother. He felt a strong need to, wait, need to get away from North Africa. She would not return home without him, and Augustine, for whatever reason, did not want to take her with him to Rome. So he deceived her as to the time of his departure, suggesting that she stay overnight at the oratory, we might call it a shrine of St. Cyprian. Now, Monica was deeply hurt by this, and she did return to Casti. Augustine knew this would be the case, and it pained him, but for whatever reason, he felt he needed to do this. More on that later. Now, eventually, in Ro while in Rome, Augustine is appointed a professor of rhetoric in Milan. And from Rome, his dedicated friends, Nebridius and Olypius, accompanied him. It was in Milan that he would encounter Bishop Ambrose, who would be the proximate guide of his conversion. As Augustine's relationship with Monica was so critical in his life and ultimately in his conversion, it's worth spending a moment here to understand what this event where Monica was left at the dock deceived by Augustine so that he could escape Carthage and go to Rome uh, deserve some examination. And so I had decided to go to a place, Rome, where, as I had been told by all who knew such things, Carthage Carthaginian student misbehaviors were not done. But you, O oh my hope, and my portion in the land of the living, forced me to change countries for my soul's salvation. You pricked me with such goads at Carthage as drove me out of it, and you set before me certain attractions by which I might be drawn to Rome. In either case, using men who love this life of death, one set doing lunatic things, another the promise of vain things, and to reform my ways, you secretly use their perversity and my own. For those who had disturbed my peace were blind in the frenzy of their viciousness, and those who urged me to go elsewhere savored of the earth while I, detesting my real misery in this one place, hope for an unreal happiness in another. Now from here, I'm going to go to how Augustine describes Monica's uh, being left at the dock 
his departure. Why I left the one country and went to the other, you knew, O Lord, but you did not tell either me or my mother. She indeed was in dreadful grief at my going and followed me right to the seacoast. There she clung to me passionately, determined that I should go either back home with her or take her to Rome with me. But I deceived her with the pretense that I had a friend whom I did not want to leave until he had sailed off with a fair wind. Thus I lied to my mother and such, mo such a mother, and got so got away from her. But this also you have mercifully forgiven me, bringing me from the waters of that sea, filled as it was with execrable uncleanness, unto the water of your grace, so that when I was washed clean, the floods that poured from my mother's eyes, the, the tears with which she daily watered the ground, towards which she bent her face in prayer for me, should cease to flow. She would not return home without me, but I managed with some difficulty to persuade her to spend the night in a place near the ship where there was an oratory in memory of St. Cyprian. That night I stole away without her. She, she remained praying and weeping. And what was she praying for, O oh my God, with all those tears, but that you should not allow me to sail? But you saw deeper and granted the essential of her prayer. You did not do what she was at the moment asking, that you might do the thing that she was always asking. The wind blew and filled our sails, and the shore dropped from our sight. And the next morning she was frantic with grief, filled her ears with her moaning and complaints, because you seemed to treat her tears so lightly. When, in fact, you were using my own desires to snatch me away for the healing of those desires, and were justly punishing her own too earthly affection for me with the scourge of grief. For she loved me she loved to have me with her, as is the way of mothers, but far more than most mothers, and she did not realize what joys you would bring her from my going away. She did not realize it, and so she wept and lamented by the torments she suffered, showed the heritage of Eve in her, seeking with sorrow what in sorrow she had actually brought forth. But when she had poured out all her accusation at my cruel deception, she turned once more to prayer for you, for me. She went home, and I went to Rome. Even in the beloved saintly Monica, Augustine could see, in her earthly clinging to him, a touch of that egotism of original sin. After his escape, quote, from Monica, Augustine was welcomed in Rome with the scourge of bodily illness, in his own words. He became ill with a fever, uh, a very threatening fever, uh, upon his arrival in Rome. And this would uh, be followed by a certain lingering in Manichaeism, an encounter with philosophical skepticism in Rome and in its academic circles, and Rome would eventually disappoint him, but would, with great fortune, great providence, lead him eventually to Milan. As we said, fever gripped Augustine shortly after his arrival in Rome, and he had another brush with death. He fell very ill, and he recovered at the house of a fellow Manichaean hearer. Now, his grip with Manichaeism was, was still there. It was wa wavering, uh, and certainly his associations and the caring quality of, of some of the Manichees for him uh, was, was very, very genuine, and so he stayed with them. But his uh, grip, uh, or we should say perhaps Manichaeum's grip on Augustine, was clearly weakening. He would describe it as, I very, very nearly went to hell, fearing his death at that time, bearing all the weight of deadly sins which I had committed against you and myself and other men, over and above the bond of original sin, whereby we all die in Adam. Augustine had feared, as he looked back, that he could have died then, still unbaptized, and not be saved. Now, part of what was hanging him up here was the Manichaean denial of a genuine crucifixion, 
of Christ. They considered it a phantasm, sort of an image, but not a reality. And it was basically an inability to accept that God would occupy a human body, which was physical. Again, part of the dualist problem. He would lament his treatment of Monica. It continued to bother him, particularly if he had died suddenly and unforgiven. But would you, O God of mercy, despise the contrite and humble heart of that chaste and pious widow, his mother? The avoidance of personal responsibility uh, kept Manichaeism alive in Augustine, for he could continue with his incontinence. He continued having his mistress and so forth. Uh, and Manichaeism would, in a way, permit that. And again, his dualistic sense of God made Catholicism very hard to approach. As he would say in Book 5, Part 10, I feared to believe the Word made flesh, lest I be forced to believe the Word defiled by flesh. As Manichaeism was losing its grip over Augustine, he encountered the philosophers of Rome at that time, the academics as they were called, who we would say fell into the class of practical skeptics, uh, that everything should be treated as a matter of doubt and affirm that no truth can be understood by man. The irony is this is something that pervades our own time. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, referred to this because this is kind of the roots of relativism, that everything is, is somehow doubtful, nothing can be held firm, or at least nothing can be understood by man. Now, during this time, uh, a bit of a blessing in his encounter with the Platonists, those kind of followers of Plato, uh, they sort of began to open Augustine's mind to the search for a truth that was somehow incorporeal that had no body, if you will. By the way, the Roman students Augustine found much better behaved than the rather wild Carthaginians, but they had another little problem. They had a tendency to take the course, and at the end, when they were due to pay their instructor, they skipped out. And this, you might say, ticked Augustine off, and was another trigger that led to his moving eventually to Carthage. Now, while he was in Rome, he received an offer to be a professor of rhetoric uh, in Milan. And, and along with that was the chance of being a rhetorician uh, it, at the practical seat of Roman, the Roman Empire in the West. Milan, Rome was the capital, but Milan was the, you might say, practically functioning capital at that time. And this also would draw Augustine away from the Manichees, which were still pretty strong in and around Rome, and provide a promise of proper funding, which had been the problem in Rome. And what he didn't know is that it would lead him towards uh, Bishop of Milan, uh, Ambrose. And this, of course, would be a great, great gift. I'm going to do two readings here, backing up a little bit, uh, Book 5, Part 10, um, and bear along with this. Thus you brought me out of that sickness and healed the son of your handmaid in this body, and he might live on to receive a better and surer way of health. At Rome I again associated with those deceived and deceiving holy ones, not only with the hearers like the man in whose house I had fallen sick and recovered, but also with those whom they called the elect. For I still held the view that it was not we that sinned, but some other nature sinning in us. And it pleased my pride to be beyond fault. And when I did any evil, not to confess that I had done it, that you might heal my soul, because it had sinned against you. I very much preferred to excuse myself and accuse some other thing that was in me, but was, was not I. But in truth, I was holy I. It was my impiety that had divided me against myself. My sin was all the more incurable because I thought I was not a sinner, and my iniquity was most execrable in that I would rather have you, God Almighty, vanquished in me to my destruction than myself vanquished by you for my salvation. You had not then as yet set a watch before my mouth, and a door round about my lips, that my heart might not incline to evil words, to make excuses in sins, 
with men that work iniquity. And therefore I was still united with their elect. All the same, because I despaired of finding any profit in that false doctrine, I began to hold slackly and carelessly even the ideas with which I had decided to rest content while I could find nothing better. Now I'm going to move on to Book 5, Part 14, which will touch on this period uh, as he's preparing to move forward. Thus I did not take great heed to learn what he was saying, but only to hear how he was saying it. This, of course, is Ambrose. The, that empty interest was all I now had since I despaired of man's finding the way to you. Yet along with the words which I admired, there also came into my mind the subject matter to which I attached no importance. I could not separate them. And while I was opening my heart to learn how eloquently he, Ambrose, spoke, I came to feel, though only gradually, how he truly spoke. First, I began to realize that there was a case for the things themselves, and I began to see that the Catholic faith, for which I had thought nothing could be said in the face of the Manichaean objections, could be maintained on reasonable grounds. This especially after I had heard explained figuratively several passages of the Old Testament, which had been the cause of death for me when taken literally. Many passages of these books, that is the Old Testament, were expounded in a spiritual sense, and I came to blame my own hopeless folly in believing that the law and the prophets could not stand against those who hated and mocked at them. I did not yet feel the Catholic way was to be followed, merely because it might have some learned men to maintain it and answer objections adequately and not absurdly. Nor did I think that what I had so far held was to be condemned, because both views were equally defensible. In fact, the Catholic side was clearly not vanquished, yet it was not clearly victorious. Then I bent my mind to see if I could, if I could by any clear proofs, convict the Manichaeans of error. If only I had been able to conceive of a substance that was spiritual, all their strong points would have been broken down and cast forth from my mind, but I could not. Concerning the body of this world and the whole of the nature which our bodily senses can attain to, I thought again and again and made many comparisons, and still judged that the views of so many of the philosophers were more probable. So in what I thought to be the manner of the academics, that is to say, doubting of all things and wavering between one and the other, I decided that I must leave the Manichees, for in that time of doubt I did not think I could remain in a sect to which I now preferred certain of the philosophers. Yet I absolutely refused to entrust the care of my sick soul to the philosophers, because they were without the saving name of Christ. I determined then to go on as a catechumen in the Catholic Church, the church of my parents, and to remain in that state until some light should appear by which I might steer my course. During this period, when Augustine would move from Tagaste to Carthage to Rome and eventually to Milan, we need to take a little bit of time aside and talk about two of his friends who he talks about uh, considerably in the Confessions. Alypius, to the left, was from Tagaste. He was a former student of Augustine's, uh, and he described him as an ardent student who became a close friend during their time in Rome. And Alypius was quite virtuous. Like Augustine, he had the parental pressure to make his way in the world. He was upper class, uh, certainly wealthier than was Augustine's family. He also became a Manichaean. Unlike Augustine, however, he embraced chastity as the condition for a pursuer of truth and reluctantly developed an incredible passion for the gladiatorial games, a kind of madness. Um, Olypius, who kind of they took to the gladiatorial games uh, with the idea of just a, you know, kind of fun and entertainment because they all kind of liked them. Uh, and Olypius was sort of dismissive. But after one time there, he found himself going back and back. And again, this is not simply like going to 
you know, a professional sports game of our time, uh, although they can have a certain madness to them. But uh, you're talking about the games uh, in which people were dying and being killed deliberately. Uh, these, these were pretty dark. Um, Olympias marveled that anyone should prefer money to honesty. Olympias was truly a virtuous man in most respects. He accompanied Augustine also to Milan upon his move there. Now, he practiced law as an assessor or government official, and it was said that he was atypically honest. Um, he refused bribes and even threats, which were commonly used. We have to understand Roman government by this point was, was quite corrupt, and pressure and bribery were, were standard fare. But apparently, Olypius never took bribes, and even when threatened, refused to bend in cases. He didn't court friendship and wasn't afraid to oppose important people. Augustine said, He shared my wavering as to the course of life we should adopt. Olypius and Nebridius would both be seekers, along with Augustine, trying to find their way in a world where complex and very mixed up options presented themselves. Nebridius was from a wealthy Carthaginian family, and he followed Augustine to Milan, as Augustine said, for no other reason than to be with me. With a real passion for truth and wisdom, he was in the same anguish as I, and the same uncertain wavering. Ardent searcher for the way of happiness, and his close investigation of the most difficult questions. This is something that Nebridius really impressed Augustine with the depth of his searching, the close investigation, to take and follow the truth wherever it led him. He opposed Augustine's persistent attraction to astrology. We haven't talked about that a lot, but Augustine had continual flirtations with astrology, especially late in his Manichaean period. Nebridius simply said, there was no art for foreseeing the future, but that human guesses sometimes chance to fall out right. Thus there were together the mouth of three needy souls, bitterly confessing to one another their spiritual poverty and awaiting upon you that might give them their food in due season. We see we can imply from this that Augustine was indeed a deeply attractive man. Friends sought his presence, his confidence, his, his guidance. Uh, many followed him. Uh, friendships for Augustine were deep, they were important, and eventually his friendship with Ambrose would be the one that would lead him over the precipice into conversion. At the age of about 30 or 31, Augustine was proposed for marriage. And he described this in his own words, more or less, as pain and pending marriage. Now, Augustine, we know, had been living with his mistress and concubine for some 15 years. But he was promised to a woman whom he could marry uh, that was arranged by Monica in his time at Milan. Now, this woman was younger than Augustine, much younger. In fact, she may have been 10 years old at the time the families came to an agreement where she would marry Augustine. Two things that come into play here. One, the family of this young woman, it was a condition of theirs that Augustine be without a mistress prior to that marriage for two years. Probably a prudent thing. The Justinian Code at the time would not allow girls to marry until they reached the age of 12, and it was said that she was still two years too young, which gives us reason to believe she was 10, unthinkable in our time, but not so in theirs. And also this whole idea of Augustine, you might say to some degree, cleaning up his act in regards to this young woman. Now, let's go back to his original woman who he was with a long time. She swore she would never know another man. But being from the lower class, in spite of their devotion to each other, she returned to North Africa and did, apparently, uh, never know another man. She lived singly. Augustine himself uh, couldn't handle this. He was deeply hurt by her departure, 
They were deeply attached. And he lamented that she was torn from my side as a hindrance to my forthcoming marriage. Sometime later, Augustine, in spite of this prohibition, did take another woman as a mistress, unable to, as he said, bear the delay of two years. He goes on to say, thus my soul's disease was nourished and kept alive as vigorously as ever, indeed worse than ever, nor was the wound healed that had been made by cutting off from my former mistress, for there was at first burning and bitter grief, and after that it festered, and as the pain grew duller, it only grew and made me more hopeless. Augustine did sever his relationship with the woman promised to him in marriage upon his conversion. Augustine is now about 30, 31 years of age. He's in kind of that beginning, that near adult life. He's left his youth behind, if you will. And Augustine, where is he at at this point in time? Well, Manichaeism is still around. He's rejected it. It doesn't answer the questions well anymore. But nothing has really replaced it yet for Augustine. He's in a kind of spiritual and religious limbo. He's a professional rhetorician, both as a teacher and in terms of active in the field. He would serve kind of as a lawyer at times, defending the guilty for money. A professional liar, as he sometimes referred to himself, when he would serve as a rhetorician, a propagandist, if you will, for the empire, oftentimes not believing what he said, but saying it so well that it would be convincing. And even his initial attraction to Ambrose was because of his rhetorical capacity and his fatherly kindness. Not really the doctrine yet. The doctrine hadn't penetrated him enough to where we would say that was the case. He had this off-and-on attraction to the Mathematici, the horoscope casters, astrology, if you will, uh, the attempt to ascertain from the stars the influence on human destiny, uh, which, as we know, is simply a vain manifestation of a rather dark tendency to seek um, to know the future with some kind of certainty. Uh, we can all fall into that trap. Perhaps we've all read a few horoscopes along the way. But the point is, this may have, may have been a dark manifestation of his melancholic temperament as a rather lost man trying to know the future. He describes, near the end of Book 6, I became more wretched, and thou more close to me. Thy right hand was ready to pluck me from the mire and wash and clean me, though I knew it not. Reflecting back, Augustine doesn't know that at this point where he has to be deeply, deeply frustrated, tired, exhausted, lost, that he's right on the precipice of finding his way. Page 30 of Augustine is most clearly reflected in his writings in Book 7 of the Confessions. Now, age 30 at that time was thought to be kind of a midpoint of life, uh, and frequently it would be a time in which one was thought to have left youth and entered adulthood fully. And we see Augustine's thought maturing as certain intellectual walls to the Catholic faith that have been in his way are going to begin to tumble down. And Book 7 is kind of an interlude of reflections as he approaches or gets close to actual conversion. In his own words, he says, his evil sinful youth was over and he had come to young manhood. Now he's still sinning and still involved in illicit relationships and so forth. But he's rejecting dualism, the whole Manichaeism and the materialist views of reality. A certain negative theology is at work in Augustine. When he's beginning to discover what isn't or what can't be, it opens him to accept formerly inconceivable senses of reality, particularly the whole idea of an incorporeal reality, which is our God. He begins to accept that God is incorruptible, inviolable, and immutable. Now these, again, would give him some real legs upon which his theology can begin to fly eventually. He begins to accept that he has a free will. Uh, he's no longer caught in the, 
too deeply in the, the struggle that he's upon between good and evil. But he is still struggling with what is the origin and sources of evil. And again, this is a classic challenge to the idea of the good God throughout the ages. He eventually rejects astrology via the arguments of his young, young friend and fine soul, Nebridius. And then he meets an old man, Vindicianus, who he describes as a man of great mental acuteness. And between the two of them, he goes on to say, By now I had rejected the ridiculous prophesyings and blasphemous lies of the astrologers. And he begin to re begins to realize that all things are good and that all substances are from God and hence good. In Book 7, Part 14, he says, There is no sanity, now by sanity he would mean health or soundness, in those whom anything in creation displeases, any more than there was in me when I was displeased with many things that you had made. I'm going to move on now to Part 7, or Book 7, Part 8. Ironically, while in the middle of this text, it's kind of a prayerful summary of the whole book. He says this, But you, O Lord, abide forever, nor are you angry with us forever, for you have pity upon our dust and ashes. It was pleasing in your sight to reshape what was deformed in me, and you kept stirring me with your secret goad, so that I should remain unquiet until you should become clear to the gaze of my soul. And from the secret hand of your healing, my swollenness was abated, and the troubled and darkened sight of my mind was daily made better by the stinging ointment of sorrow. Clearly, Augustine is in a time of great suffering. He's lost. But God is working through this to lead him back to himself. And finally, I will be reading from Book 7, Part 17, uh, a rather lengthy set of um, selections from this, from this book. We see Augustine in this vacillating at the very precipice of conversion. And I marveled to find that at last I loved you, and not some phantom instead of you. Yet I did not stably enjoy my God, but was ravished to you by your beauty, yet soon was torn away from you again by my own weight, and fell again with torment to lower things. Carnal habit was that weight, yet the memory of you remained with me, and I knew without doubt that it was you to whom I should cleave, though I was not yet such as could cleave to you, for the corruptible body is a load upon the soul, and the earthly habitation presses down the mind that muses upon many things. I had discovered the immutable and true eternity of truth above my changing mind. Thus by stages I pass from bodies to the soul, which uses the body for its perceiving, and from this to the soul's inner power, to which the body's senses pre present external things, as indeed the beasts are able. And from there I passed on to the reasoning power, to which is referred for judgment what is received from the body's senses. Then indeed I clearly saw your invisible things which are understood by the things that are made. But I lacked the strength to hold my gaze fixed, and my weakness was beaten back again, so that I returned to my old habits, bearing nothing with me but a memory of delight, and a desire for something of which I had caught in the fragrance, but which I had not yet the strength to eat. Before going into the final section on Augustine's conversion, we see here we've been studying this 10-year period where Augustine struggles with all kinds of things. Why do we go on retreats? Why do we read? Why do we study? Why do we pray? It's all about conversion. This is the business of Christian life, to become ever more uh, the true image of God that we were created to be. Now, we think of our own conversions. We may think of conversions for those dear to us whom we hope to draw into the faith or deeper into the faith. Let's close with a few thoughts uh, from Augustine 
and one or two others along the way. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. From St. Paul's Letter to the Romans. It was pleasing in your sight to reshape what was deformed in me. From Augustine Book 7, Part 8. You humble the proud like one wounded, and I was separated from you by my own swollenness, as though my cheeks had swelled out and closed up my eyes. Again from Book 7, Part 7. But it is good for me to adhere to my God, for if I abide not in him, I cannot abide in myself. Book 7, Part 11. Without God, we are lost. And finally, a word from a prayer journal of Pope John Paul II. Sin is, extinguishes prayer in us. If prayer returns, sin has to subside. Thank you.